Welcome. I'm Alex. I'm a DevOps coach, mentor, consultant with DLM Consultants. I'm also the co-organizer of Data Relay, which is a conference that was going to run this week, but world events kind of overtook us. I'm also the creator of SpeakingMentors.com. It's a website where uh, a whole bunch of experienced speakers have put their details out and said, look, I'm willing to help any new speaker that wants to get started uh, to speak at their own local tech meetup or a tech conference. So if you want to get into speaking, check out speakingmentors.com and there are a bunch of people there who are willing to give you their time to help for free, no questions asked. I'm also a Microsoft Data Platform MVP and today I want to talk about DevOps. Let's get started. Right. Hi. So this is the format we were asked to use for our presentations. And I'm down here in this little box. Hello, you can probably see me, I'm down here. Um, and you're probably squinting to look at me right now and thinking, isn't that slide really ugly? Well, the, we, the reason we design our slides like this it's because of a bygone era where we, we, we actually designed our slides to be presented live. When I'm presenting live, I've got the whole screen that I can use for my slide, and I just stand in front of it and tell you a story. And you're engaging with me, the speaker, and frankly, if you were engaging with the slides, then that's a bit dull. Bullet point slides that you can skip through in two minutes in SlideShare, what's the point in that? The reason that you come to conferences is to hear the speaker and have the speaker tell you something. Because if the speaker isn't engaging and exciting, then then, then what's the point in the whole thing? So I'm gonna do something a bit different. Hello. This feels a bit more like it, right? This feels like a layout that is a better designed for an online first conference. You've got all my slide over here and I can refer to it as I'm going. It means I need to redesign my slides a bit. It means I need to chop and change them a bit, but it means I need to do things a bit differently. Um, and by the way, let's get rid of those bullet points. Let, let, let's put something a bit more inspirational on the screen. This is Rear Admiral Grace Hopper. If you don't know who she is, you're probably watching this on a device that has a web browser. Google her. She's one of the most inspirational uh, characters in the history of computing. The most damaging phrase in the language is we've always done it that way. We've always done it that way. I'm adapting the way that I'm laying out the screen here because I'm delivering it online. And in IT, we need to adapt the way that we work in order to catch up with modern events. This session is going to be about DevOps. It's a new way of working that's better designed for the world that we live in and the way that we need to deliver software in the year 2020. I'm going to start by talking about why it's important. What are the big changes that we've seen? And why does that necessitate that we manage software development differently? I'm then going to talk about how. So we need to make a change. What does that change look like? How do we change the way that we work? And finally, I'm going to talk about the details. Source control, deployment, monitoring, all of those things that we think of when we think about DevOps. They're the details. They're, they're the result. What matters is why we're here in the first place. This is a 101 session about DevOps. So I'm really coming at this from first principles. Um, this is designed for anybody that's new to the subject and wants to have a little bit of a better theoretical understanding about why we're all doing this stuff in the first place, rather than a deep dive into the technicality of one particular implementation of something that we refer to as DevOps. Okay, So if what you're looking for is a deep dive on database deployment, this isn't the session for you. If what you're looking for is a deep dive on source control or monitoring or testing or Docker or all of these wonderful things, there are all sorts of other sessions. And I'm going to point them out at the end of my talk. This is a talk about what is the point and why. So I started by saying we've always done that, always does it. I started out by saying it's terrible to say we've always done it that way, just repeating stuff the same way without really questioning it. Well, for a lot of us, um, this is the way that we used to deliver software. It's a de facto. It's the way we've always done it. We, we come up with a bunch of requirements. We put some sort of design together. Then we write some code. Then we test it. Then we deploy it to our customers. And you know what? 
That makes sense. It completely makes sense in the 1970s and the 1980s. And the reason why it makes sense in the 1970s and 80s, and this is a slide from Tom Limoncelli. By the way, in this talk, I'm going to try as much as possible to stand on the shoulder of giants. What I mean is, I'm not a particularly revolutionary thinker. All I do is read the books by people who are. And so what I'm going to try and do, rather than reinventing my own flavour of DevOps like so many people do, I'm going to try and use the words and the phrases and the books and the language of the people who have come before me and who have led the industry, because I think that's a lot more valuable. You don't want to hear what my definition of DevOps is. You want to hear what, how the people that led the movement thought of it. And so, and so that's what I'm going to try and do. Um, this session is uh, Tom Lemoncelli uh, talking about DevOps at Google. And this is kind of the session that really set the SRE movement on fire, the site on fire, the site reliable, ugh, the site reliability engineering movement on fire, which is possibly the latest trendy word when people mean DevOps. Um, so this is his slide that demonstrates what uh, software development looked like in the 1970s and 80s. And in the top left corner over here, um, you can see that familiar waterfall diagram. Uh, and then you've got floppy disks. Because what we used to do is we used to write our software, we'll burn it onto some sort of floppy disk or CD-ROM or whatever, uh, we'll make a million copies, distribute it out to a bunch of stores, and then people would come into the store, pick it up physically in hand, take it home, and then they'll run it. Back in this era, dev and ops didn't work for the same company. The developers wrote the software, but they didn't have to run it. They didn't have to administer it. They didn't have to manage it. It was the, it was the development house's customers that would have to run it in the wild. So the operations team lived at your customer and the development team wrote the software to begin with. The way that the two interacted was through documentation pages and support desks. And necessarily so, because it was a completely different job. Writing the software and running the software were just not thought of as in any way related at all. And when you're going to go through a whole distribution process, it might take months and cost a huge amount of money. You, you better be sure that the thing works. You don't get a lot of second guesses at it. It's very hard to release a patch if you've discovered a mistake. Which is why the whole waterfall process worked in the 1970s and 80s. Then the 1990s came along and we had a dot-com boom. And the reason was because we're still managing software the old way, despite the fact that it was a completely different world now. People had started to shift away from writing software that you write onto a disk and you physically sell to a customer, and they'd started to move to a world where software was available to download. It was on a website. You, were, you Possibly the product was the website itself. Maybe you're offering some sort of web service. Hotmail, Gmail, whatever. Um, Google. Um, these sorts of services could be updated whenever you wanted at the click of a button. Deploying software became orders of magnitude easier. You think it's hard to release software at the moment. Imagine having to burn it onto a, a million disks and physically ship it to all of your stores. Like, like software deployments became orders of magnitude easier. And it became much easier to fix things on the go. And it became much easier to ship a small version of your product much, much earlier in the development process to test whether or not you're really building the right thing and test whether customers liked it. And that completely changed the economics of software development. One of the consequences of this is operations teams didn't necessarily live, work for the customers anymore. Sometimes they work for the content providers. Sometimes they worked alongside the developers or, well, maybe the other side of kind of the trenches. Um, and this led way to the wall of confusion issue, which was articulated so well in this slide by Andrew Clay Schaefer at Velocity Conference in 2009. The same conference, by the way, um, for, uh, as the uh, 10 Deploys a Day talk, which is the one that normally gets the headlines when we're talking about kind of the genesis of DevOps. Um, so this is a wall of confusion. This is probably something you recognize in your organization. You've got a, a, a group of developers and a group of operations folks and the developers will throw updates over the wall to the operations folks and it will never go very well. And the communication between the two teams is bad. Collaboration, cooperation doesn't really work very well. Um, and this is by the time we got to the early, by the time we get into the noughties, 
we're beginning to recognize that this is a problem that we need to solve. We need to get better at solving this problem. And over that period of time, a whole bunch of amazing books were written. There's a whole bunch of stuff in there, way too much for me to really kind of cover everything. Um, the, since 2014, there have been a whole bunch of research done in the form of these stated DevOps reports where um, researchers have uh, sent out questionnaires and thousands of respondents have reported back on details about how they're managing their software development workflow and, and how effective it is. Um, and the place I think is the most sensible place to start to learn to understand DevOps is this book, Accelerate. What this book does is it looks back over the first four years of the State of DevOps reports from 2014 to 2017. And it pulls together the information, it pulls together the data and it tries to do science on it. It tries to conduct statistical analysis on it to figure out if all the claims that the DevOps folks have been making are true or whether it's just a sales pitch. Um, and long story short, it is true. It does make a measurable difference if you do all the DevOps stuff, which I'll get onto. Um, if you do all of that, it does have a measurable difference. So what they didn't accelerate is they grouped together um, the various different respondents in the state of DevOps surveys into low performing, medium performing and high performing teams. And, and, and the way they did that is they looked at these four metrics, deployment frequency, lead time, mean time to restore and change failure rate. Why these four metrics? Why these? Well, it turns out that these four metrics are tightly related to business success. They have a causal link. So analysis over several years shows that high performing organizations as measured by the four metrics before um, were consistently twice as likely to exceed the profitability, market share and productivity of low performance. And they, all of the mathematical workings are shown here. If you're a statistics geek, then go check it. But the, the long story short is they found a causal predictive link between the folks that were doing this stuff and the folks that were making money and that were winning in the marketplace. Um, to try and explain why this is, because a, a, a lot of folks make the mistake of looking at this list of things and thinking they're incompatible. Um, because basically the top two talk about how fast you go and how many deployments you make and how quickly you're making deployments. And the bottom two talk about how safe you're going and how much testing you're doing and how much reliability. And there's, and there's this antiquated idea that may have worked in the 1970s and 1980s, but doesn't work anymore. There's this idea that the more testing you do and the more time you spend on testing, the slower your process goes, but the more reliable your product is. That's wrong. It doesn't work that way anymore. And the reason for that was expressed really well by Chuck Rossi when he was at Facebook. Uh, what he said is, if we need, if we want more changes, we need more deployments. Let me try and explain what he means by that. So he was working at Facebook at a time, which is probably could be any time for any company, where they were there was a lot of pressure on them to get more stuff done. That's all of us, right? That's our entire lives. Um, and the problem he found is as there's pressure to get more stuff done, the size of their deployments were growing and growing and growing, and eventually they started failing and failing and failing. And what he recognized was that as a deployment gets above a certain size, it always, always, always goes wrong. And that's because there's too much going on, it's too complicated, it's too difficult to understand it, and when it does go wrong, it's really difficult to fix it. So what he's saying effectively is we need to scale out our deployments, not scale them up. Because if we, if we try to do too much, they go wrong, so what we need to do is we need to deploy more often in smaller chunks. And if we deploy more often in smaller chunks, we can reliably release more stuff and get more stuff done. And when we do break stuff, it's a lot easier to fix it. Um, so the key point is that these four metrics, deployment frequency is how many times a day I deploy, lead time is how long it takes to get from idea into production, how long does it take to complete a piece of work, these two things obviously work a lot better if we work in much, much smaller batches, focus on one thing at a time and get it into production in small batches. Mean time to restore is how quickly I can fix it when stuff goes wrong. Well, if I've only changed one or two things, it's a lot easier to, first of all, understand what went wrong, and second of all, fix it. And change failure percentage. If I'm only making a small number of changes, it's unlikely I'm going to break stuff. So, these are my four key metrics. 
And these are the four things that we want to focus on in order to drive significantly more effective IT performance. So the next question is how? How do we do that? And um, before we get into that, I'm going to start talking about lean software development. And I'm going to reference um, uh, the Mary and Tom Poppendix kind of seminal text uh, from the 1990s, I think. It goes back a bit further than the rest of them. Um, what they do in this book is, and this is before DevOps, um, this is kind of possibly even before Agile, um, what they're doing is talking about lean manufacturing, which was well established um, in terms of kind of the Toyota manufacturing process, um, it, kind of the Japanese, if you like, idea about how we create cars um, in contrast to mass production. Um, and it was a fundamentally different way that people thought about managing physical manufacturing sites. And what they did is they said, look, the same principles apply to IT. So in order to understand the next bit, we need to understand a little bit about lean. So that's what my next slides are going to talk about. So this is a very rough and ready diagram that tries to explain the difference between kind of economies of scale and mass production and kind of big construction lines where we work on big batches of product at a time versus <clears throat> what for many in the lean uh, community considered to be the ideal, which is one piece flow, where we're basically working on one piece at a time. Um, and so what you can see, we've got three workstations here, yellow, red, and blue. Um, and each workstation needs to do a bit of work on before we can get something out. So if this was a car manufacturing plant, you can imagine um, the first step was painting the chassis, the next step was putting the chassis on the wheels, um, and then the next step was doing all the interiors. I don't know, I've no, I don't make cars, I don't know if that's how you make cars, I'm, I'm guessing. Um, and you can see in the batch process on the left, there's a lot of stock lying around the workshop. Um, waiting for somebody else to get stuff done. Uh, assuming that each one of these operations takes an hour, um, you can see that it's going to take approximately two days for any one particular car to get out of the other end. So you've got a lead time there of two days um, ish, 12 hours. Um, if there's a mistake with any one piece and it's not found until the blue person at the end uh, spots it, then you've got two days between the error being produced and it being fixed, by which time the yellow person who might have created the mistake is now thinking about something else. So there are a whole bunch of problems with batch processing. With, with one piece flow, you're basically working on one thing at a time. That you don't have these huge piles of stock lying around the workshop. Um, when issues are created, um, when, when mistakes happen, they tend to be spotted much, much more quickly um, and therefore they tend to be much easier to resolve. And also the amount of time it takes me to produce a complete unit is only two hours in this scenario or three hours maybe. Um, so we can see that one piece flow is significantly more effective and, and it's basically the way that our entire supply chain networks work these days um, because stuff gets to places much, much more quickly at a much lower cost when we... Um, uh, work on one piece flow or just in time production um, is another word that's been banding around the headlines recently. Um, so that's my attempt to quickly explain what lean is, although lean is much, much bigger and more complicated and I could run an entire precon on it and still not scratch the surfaces. Um, one of the interesting things that Mary and Tom do in their book is they take Taicho Ono's Seven Deadly Sins of Lean. Um, which is all based on kind of creating physical things, cars and stuff. Uh, and they translate Taito Ono's Seven Deadly Sins into the equivalent Seven Deadly Sins for software development. And this is what we end up with. Unfinished work, feature relearning, handoffs, delays, context switching and defects. These are all the typical bad things that are hugely, cost uh, that are hugely painful. Um, so unfinished work is... Uh, are you working in a system where there are 151 unfinished things that you want to get done or working on different feature branches or all living in the dev environment at the same time? That must create a mess. You're treading on each other's toes all over the time. Um, there's a huge amount of work that's gone into producing these 
uh, there's a huge amount of time that has gone into producing these this unfinished work um, but no value is yet released from it because it's not yet deployed to production so you're not getting whatever return you'd originally hoped for um, so all of that time and effort has effectively been wasted until it's been deployed into production um, and then you can start thinking about the lost opportunity cost on top of that it becomes awful feature creep I probably don't need to go into feature creep in a huge amount of detail you're probably all aware of what feature creep means it's where people just keep adding to your requirements um, uh, and possibly some of the features aren't necessarily necessary or valuable uh, relearning is basically poor documentation having to relearn how to do a thing over and over and over again basically it's it, it's the the absence of mastery and skill and repetition um, handoffs uh, these delays that we get between different departments uh, so for example I might um, I might have only spent an hour doing a piece of work but then the the thing I've been working on waits in a queue for two weeks before the next person is ready to review it and deploy it that means that my lead time even though I've only spent about an hour working on the thing is can't be better than two weeks um, which is horrendously inefficient it leads to which leads to more unfinished work um, and all the problems that, that creates delays delays obviously context switching as developers we all understand context switching where where I'm not able to just focus on one thing at a time and get it done and get it into production where I've got 150 things at once and I'm kind of jumping from this thing to this thing to this thing to this thing it's a, it, it's really taxing uh, on the individual and it's painful um, and it's slow and it's inefficient and finally defects and the notable thing about defects bugs if you like um, is the earlier we find them in the process the cheaper they are to fix and the later we find them in the process they are orders of magnitude harder to fix so for example as I'm writing some code if I see a mistake I fix it almost straight away <clears throat> if I have committed that code to source control and it's found by my testers it might get bounced back to me a week later I have to relearn what I was doing I have to refigure it all out and then I've got to fix it and I've possibly caused a delay of a couple of weeks or something and then it goes into production that's that's expensive if it accidentally gets into production then I might have broken the deployment which is a lot more expensive or I might not have broken the deployment but two years later some customer finds it and then it ends up being bounced off a support person escalated to the engineering team triage and then never fixed and then I've got a whole bunch of wasted time looking into it. It's never going to get fixed. So it's a permanent defect in my system. My customers are upset. It's I've got a flaky product. That's not a great situation for anybody. So these are the things that we really want to try and avoid. Um, now, Ilyahu Goldratt, who wrote The Goal, which is an excellent book, it, it, it tells a story about a car manufacturing plant that gradually implements lean. Um, and rather than being a boring, dry textbook, like a lot of books are about lean, um, manufacturing it's uh, an engaging and funny book um, storybook uh, so that's quite a good book and one of the things that he says is that in any flow of work there's a direction of flow um, but there's one and only one bottleneck and any improvement not made at the bottleneck is an illusion and now let me try and explain to you what that means so let's imagine this workflow where I've got the yellow person the red person and the blue person and there's a pile of work building up in front of the red person now if my approach to DevOps is to optimize the yellow and the red person and to make the yellow and the red person move much, much, much more quickly, um, then all I'm going to be doing is creating this big pile of work in front of the blue person they can't possibly hope to fix. So it's a waste of time. That's what, that's what, um, uh, that's what Ilyahu Goldratt is saying. It's a waste of time optimizing anything that isn't the constraint. The problem here is a big pile of work that's building up in front of the blue engineer and we can't get anything we're never going to be able to get more done than than what the blue engineer can do um, so the things we might want to start thinking about here are first of all can we um, support the blue engineer to get more stuff done uh, can we make sure that we're investing a little bit more of the red and the yellow people's time to make sure that we're preparing these updates in a, a more appropriate way so that the blue person can can do the work more easily um, can we ask the yellow and the blue person to do less work do we need to reorganize our teams to make sure that there's more collaboration going and the yellow and the red tape person are picking up more of the burden these are the sorts of things that we want to start asking ourselves to avoid those seven deadly sins 
Um, uh, because if we don't, then if we take a look back at those seven deadly sins, uh, possibly not all of them are turning up here, but a fair few of them uh, raising their ugly heads and making our entire process significantly less efficient and significantly more painful. One of the best tools that we have in our arsenal to find this is something called value stream mapping. Now, this is a photo I've taken from uh, one of the pages of the DevOps handbook, um, which um, is basically a manual for adopting DevOps. Um, and it's another great book that I wanted to call out. Um, and what we're basically doing is we are recording each of the different steps that we need to go through. And this is something I often do with my customers when I go on site. I say, right, okay, this recent deployment that went wrong, when was the work item taken off the backlog? What was done next? What development work was done? What were all the actions that were taken? How much time was spent on them? How much time was spent waiting for the next action to occur? And where did we find failures along the way? And what we can do is we can create a value stream map that looks a bit like this, where we record at each phase in our process um, how long we spend on the work, how long stuff is waiting, and what are the chances that um, the work is going to be rejected from the previous workstation. Um, or the percentage of the time that it's work, the work is completed accurately. And by doing this, we can call out those areas that are uh, bottleneck in our process. And often it's the approval step because often stuff waits for two weeks to be approved. Um, and then somebody spends about five minutes looking at it and ticks a button. And so you've got two weeks worth of delay for five week, for five minutes worth of effort. And when you think about everything that you've learned, it's far more important to finish work than it is to start work. So anybody that is hijacking the release of stuff, making it wait for two weeks so that they can come and spend five minutes, they need to seriously rethink their priorities. Um, one of the main principles is it's more important to finish work than to start work. And any delays to work going through the system should be jumped on as a matter of urgency. And it's very difficult to make a case that whatever else they're doing is more important than releasing work at the la in the latter stages of the pipeline. So this is ultimately what we want to achieve. We want to be able to release often. We want to be able to release in small batches. Quickly, we want there to be a short time between starting the work and deploying it to production. We want to be able to easily recover from failed deployments. Um, and we want to make sure that our overall percentage of uh, successful deployments is fairly high. That's what we want to achieve. So how are we going to do it? Oh, what are we going to do to achieve that? Well, there are a lot of things. <laughs> um, if you ask somebody what DevOps is and they want to give you a particular practice or a particular idea, there's a whole bunch of stuff they might come back at you with. And I'm not even going to try to go into all of this stuff. The, the purpose of this slide isn't to try and give you an index of things you need to look up. It's just to try and demonstrate the sheer amount of stuff that now gets bundled together as DevOps. Um, what I'm going to try and do is rather than focus on any specific part, I'm going to say, what does it look like for an organization to adopt DevOps, if you will? Well, uh, one of the best ones comes from the Phoenix project, and it's picked up in the DevOps handbook as well, by the way. These two books are designed to actually go side by side. Um, uh, in the Phoenix Project, Gene Kim, the author, talks about the three ways. Uh, so the first way is flow. This is basically what I was showing you before, that value stream mapping, that, that, um, uh, that focus that's made on trying to make sure that we can get stuff done quickly and easily and um, there's not a long delay from starting work to it going into production. Uh, that efficient flow of work into production. Uh, the next thing we want to do is focus, uh, and by the way, that also comes out of a, a, an older idea about what DevOps is, which is this idea of aha to ka the, the businesses that can get their ideas into production, delivering value, earning them money quickly, are the ones that tend to succeed in the marketplace. Um, the research from Accelerate has demonstrated that we don't live in a world where big beats small or where rich beats poor. We live in a world where fast beats slow. Um, and so it's those organizations that can go from aha to ka quickly um, are the ones that tend to succeed in our workplace. So the first step is aha to ka -ching. 
Um, the second step is uh, feedback. Uh, so it's finding out not just I put it into production quickly, but is it working? Is it delivering the value I wanted? Whoever it was that asked me to make the button blue instead of green presumably did so because they thought it was going to increase click-throughs or it was going to increase conversion rates or it was going to increase awareness. <clears throat> well, is it? And this has consequences both at an engineering level, kind of does the thing work? Is it, are the tests passing? Is the monitoring looking healthy? Is the thing working? But also from a business level, um, are my customers enjoying it? Are they happy with it? Are they not happy with it? Um, did they prefer the old version? These are the sorts of questions we want to be asking ourselves to make sure um, that we're not just doing stuff for the sake of it, that the stuff that we're doing actually matters. Um, and based on that feedback, we can then come up with the next idea. And that leads on to the next thing, which is this culture of continuous experimentation and learning, where we're beginning to embrace kind of testing in production, A-B testing, and we're taking a very scientific attitude, a very data-driven attitude um, to the way that we do work so that we can try as quickly as possible to run tests on which version works the best and then we can adopt that version. And the organisations that can do that effectively, scientifically, ruthlessly <clears throat> are the ones that tend to win in the marketplace. Um, so that's one way of thinking about DevOps. Um, it's very high level though, it's very strategic. Um, it's difficult for an engineer on the front line to really drive that as much as they would like to. Uh, they might be able to do small things in that direction, but this is a broader, higher level organizational thing. Um, so what can you as an individual do to help push in this direction? Well, more recently, just last year, Gene Kim released a sequel to the Phoenix Project. It's called The Unicorn Project. Um, by the way, I should say that both of these books are kind of inspired by Ilyahu Goldratt's earlier book, The Goal. I said this was a storybook about a manufacturing plant that adopted lean principles. Well, these are books about an IT organisation that adopts DevOps. And they're written in the same style. In actual fact, uh, Gene Kim specifically wanted to make these books an homage to the earlier book, The Goal, uh, by Ilyahu Goldratt. Um, and the difference between them is the Phoenix Project was written from the context of a senior leader in the operations team, but the Unicorn Project was written from the perspective of the frontline developer on the dev team. So you've got, in the one book, you've got everything told kind of from an ops and senior leadership perspective. In the other book, it comes from a dev and frontline engineer perspective. <coughs> Pardon me. And one of the key things that comes out of the Unicorn Project is this concept of the five ideals. The first ideal is locality and simplicity. I want the work that I'm doing to be close to me. I want to be able to make decisions close to me. I want to be able to run my software close to me. I don't want to have to deal. I don't want to have to walk four levels of hierarchy across and five levels, four, hier four levels of hierarchy up and five levels across to actually get the answers or the infrastructure or the things that I need. I need to be able to do stuff um, close to me. The next is focus, flow and joy. I want to be able to get to work. I want to be able to focus on work. I don't want to be distracted by meetings and politics all the time. I want to be able to see that the work that I do is running in production. I want to know that the stuff I've been working on is delivering value because it's the most depressing thing in the world to work on something for a month but not see it turn up in production until a year later, by which time I might not even be at the company anymore. Um, so from a personal motivation as well as a personal learning and development uh, and upskilling perspective, I want to see, does my stuff work? And what can I learn from it? And how can I make it better? And that leads on to the improvement of daily work. Um, and it's also related to, it's related to the aspect of psychological safety, but psychological safety is much broader. Um, basically, we want to move away from political blame circus organizations uh, where if you make a mistake, you're going to be fired. Actually, we want to throw that idea away entirely, and we want to embrace places where it's safe to fail. It's safe to be wrong. It's safe to analyse how you could have done something better, because it's in those organisations that people are far more likely um, to be happier, which is positively correlated with being productive, um, 
and uh, successful and better at their job. And really, it's a virtuous circle if you work in an organization that has that positive, generative culture. And for many people, actually, this is the most important point of DevOps. Uh, moving away from overly bureaucratic and politics-driven organizations to a place where basically engineers can work together and get stuff done happily without always looking over their shoulder. Um, and finally, customer focus. It's not the developers are no longer removed from the from the people using the stuff. Um, the developers should be having regular daily connection with the customers who are using the stuff. They should be understanding what are they liking, what are they not liking, understanding who their customer is and what their customer wants and what their customer needs is crucial to coming up with great software um, and delivering on those needs. And the developers that truly and instinctively understand what drives their customers are the ones that are likely to be able to create better software um, and make better decisions with all the trade-offs that they're making all the time between the various different ways of completing a piece of work. Um, so these are five things that everybody can think about how they can build that in their own um, in their own place of work. But still, I'm most of the way through now, and still I've not really gone on to practical stuff. I've talked about ideas, I've talked about thoughts, I've talked about um, the ideas underpinning this, but I've not talked about what does it practically mean. Well, what Gene Kim, who wrote both the Phoenix Project and the Unicorn Project says, is that what I find so amazing is that as an organization goes from code deployment lead times that are measured in months, maybe even quarters, down to minutes, the constraint moves in some pretty predictable ways. Remember what uh, Ilyahu Goldratt said about the constraint or the bottleneck. Um, there's no point doing anything other than fixing the bottleneck, because anything else you do is just creating problems elsewhere. And this is the order that he says. Uh, and he says this, by the way, in a book called Beyond, in an audio book called Beyond the Phoenix Project, which is um, himself and John Willis talking through many of the ideas from the Phoenix Project. And it's a really, really good listen. I've listened through several times, and each time I've listened through, I've got something else from it. <clears throat> the first thing that normally bottlenecks organizations is environment creation. How often are you waiting for a dev environment? How often are you waiting for an appropriate test environment? That's normally the first thing. It should be self-service environment creation is important and that's where tools like Puppic and chef and um, infrastructure as code stuff powershell dsc arm templates um, any cloud provider that allows you to spin up machines as you need them that's where all of that stuff comes from docker um, clones like redgate sql provision and dba clone that sort of stuff is all about creating environments that you need and then we've got code deployment and wrapped into that is source control for database folks. Uh, I think Gene kind of assumes that we have source control down, which is why he goes on to code deployments. But with database folks, that's not necessarily guaranteed. So I'm going to wrap into environment creation, code deployment, source control as well. Uh, then code deployment, how painful are our deployments? We need it to, to be basically click of a button. That's what we want because um, that takes the overhead associated with deploying away. Um, and once the overhead has gone away, it frees us up to deploy much, much, much more frequently, which leads to shorter lead times, many more deploys a day, which leads to more reliability. Um, and so it's that virtual circle that they were talking about in Accelerate earlier on. Testing. We need to really think about testing. If we're releasing 10 times a day, we can't go through an entire manual test cycle 10 times a day, which means we need to think a lot about how we're going to automate it. And there are various strategies to that. They have various trade-offs. But it's essential that we are able to automate a large bunch of our testing so that we can uh, have an effective testing strategy. Um, that's not to say, by the way, that manual testing does not have a place. It's not to say that exploratory testing isn't valuable. It's not to say that our QA engineers and our test engineers aren't extremely valuable people. They are the people that know best how to break our product, and we need them to be part of it. I'm not in any way saying that they're not needed anymore, but I am saying they need to work differently in the same way that developers and operations folks and everybody else needs to work differently. So there, there's nothing... Um, so I'm not for a second saying that testers are any less valuable than anybody else. Then we need to start thinking about architecture, creating loosely coupled systems so that it's easier to spin up a small part of it by itself and we can make a small change over here. Um, and when we make a mistake, it leads to a small local failure as opposed to a big global failure. 
And then finally, uh, the final bottleneck is ideas and our creativity. And that's where the bottleneck should be. Because what that basically means is um, the thing that's holding my back is my ability to come up with good ideas. And as soon as I've had a good idea, it gets into production fairly quickly. And as an engineer, we want to make sure that that getting into production fairly quickly is kind of down pat and that it's we're set up to come up with those great ideas. Um, so, uh, um, so they're the five common bottlenecks that Gene Kim sees. Um, in Accelerate, they come up with something a little bit more specific. So I'm really putting more nuts and bolts on it here. Um, they talk about 24 capabilities to drive improvement. Version control, deployment automation, continuous integration, trunk-based development, test automation, test data management, shift left on security, continuous delivery, loosely coupled architecture, architect for empowered teams, seek out customer feedback, visualize work through stream, work in small batches, foster team experimentation, lightweight change approvals, monitor across app and infra, um, check system health proactively, implement work and progress limits, visualize work and quality, generative culture, support learning, collaboration across teams, make work meaningful and transformational leadership. Now, um, I'm not at all going to go into detail on those points, but um, what I'm basically saying is when people say what is DevOps, it's not just automating your deployments. It's all of that stuff, because those 24 capabilities have a causal relationship with the four key metrics, which have a causal relationship to making money. Um, so those things are all very, very important. Um, in much so I've gone very quickly from speaking in very abstract terms to speaking in huge specific terms and covering way too much. So now I'm going to bring it back and I'm going to say, what does this mean for data folks? Well, first of all, collaboration. You need to start working much more closely with the people in other silos because typically, and maybe not you, but typically data folks live in their own little silo. DBAs feel fairly removed from the day-to-day -day development work. They're, a lot of the time, they often don't actually know what their product does um, or what are the key drivers of the development team and the business. Um, so we need to be working much, much more closely with everybody. Uh, we need to be make sure that we're source controlling our databases. And by provisioning, I mean basically self-service, give me a dev environment. Developers should be able to click a button and, and, and they have an environment with appropriate data now um we can talk all day about what's appropriate data what does that mean does it mean production data does it mean mass data does it mean um a bunch of test cases what does it mean I, like that's a whole separate that's its own session in its own right um uh, but we need to make sure that as far as the developer is concerned they can click a button and quickly within ideally less than a minute they have a dev environment ready to go and they can start work we need to think about testing Nobody in the database world does anything like enough testing. We need to start thinking about unit test frameworks. Uh, we need to start thinking about deployment. We need to make sure that our deployments are automated and quick and click of a button and reliable and safe. We should not be doing deployments by opening Management Studio and clicking F5. Um, and we need to start thinking about observability as well. So that's monitoring, testing, and it's much, much broader than that. And there's a whole monitoring versus um, observability or operational visibility um, debate that's going on at the moment um, uh, and I'm not going to get into that in any detail um, but basically we need to be able to quickly and easily see when stuff is going badly and stuff is going wrong and also when it's going well so that we can uh, both fix the stuff that's going badly and um, and uh, build on the stuff that's going well um, and that is what drives our new ideas um, and we need to be able to go through that cycle really, really, really quickly. So what I'm going to do now, and I did say there would be a demo, and as I said, I'm slightly uncomfortable about it. I know that people want to see a demo, but at the same time, and what am I going to demo? There are 24 capabilities. Um, I'm going to focus on the source control and deployment part. Um, so all of this is available at my GitHub page, uh, which is um, available um, at this site. So let's bring that up. Here we are, this is the website. Uh, this is GitHub. Uh, so you can go to this URL and you can see my code. And if you click this button, you can get this URL here and you can download it. You can do that using a command prompt, <coughs> git clone and the URL. You obviously need to, you need to install git first, which is the source control tool that I'm using. Once you do that, um, it's going to clone my repo to the file. Um, I'm running this from c.git. So if I go into 
here, I'll be able to see it's just cloned my repo down. Or it's in the process of cloning my repo down. Not quite sure why it's taking so long. Uh, it doesn't normally take that long. It's probably because I'm running two separate screen share, screen capture things at the same time for my slide and my demo. I'm also recording the video um, through uh, my webcam, so it's my computer is going nuts. Um, here is my code. Uh, so in here I have a, um, a SSDT database project. What is the point of this? Uh, what is the point of this source control? Well, basically once I need to move away from my development database being an MDF file and an LDF file. What it needs to be is something I can put into source control as scripts and I can manage the changes. Now, um, Git repos or whatever source control tool you're using, but basically Git, um, allows you to keep track of the history on objects and the changes over time. Uh, so, oh, they've changed the UI on here a while ago, and I can't remember where history now lives. Um, but if I come through here, I can see the history, um, and you can it, it keeps track of all the changes that have happened over time, comments associated with those. Um, it allows me to be deliberate about which version I'm de It gives me a concept of a version. Um, I can create different branches of my code for um, for managing different uh, for managing different updates and so on. Um, so that all ends up looking like text files that look a bit like this. So for example, for the AdventureWorks database, I've got a person schema, and inside that person schema, I've got some tables. Um, and then I've got a script here to create each one of those tables in the person schema. Is that going to open with Management Studio or Azure Data Studio? I hope Azure Data Studio because that's nice and quick. Uh, now I'm running Visual Studio, Data Studio, and two different screen capture tools and a video recording tool all at the same time. Um, so here is that creates table statement. Uh, for just from the script. Um, so my Visual Studio project contains all of those scripts and now I'm just going to wait while it loads. I might fast forward this bit. I can hit refresh and there is my database deployed to my, in this case, my local instance. Now, that deployment process can be automated through various PowerShell and command line tools. So uh, sqlpackage.exe is the typical command line tool we use. You can use uh, DBA tools to do this with PowerShell. And uh, there are various other source control tools that you can use as well if you don't want to use SSDT. Redgate's got a bunch of good stuff. You can look at dbup, flyaway. There are a whole bunch of good tools that you can use. Uh, let's skip past the uh, demo now. Uh, so so in summary, what is DevOps? Well, sure, it's a bunch of technical practices, but it's also about the way that we work together. And it's about um, humans and process. It's about all of these things. Microsoft has summarized it like this. DevOps is the union of people, process, and products to enable continuous delivery of value to our end users. The use of the word products is probably a little bit controversial there um, because one of the hang-ups that DevOps folks have is that it's all about tools when, yeah, we use tools to automate this and that, but, but as I've tried to demonstrate in this presentation, DevOps isn't just about tools. T tools are just something we use to make our life easier. Um, another common way to summarize it is CAMS. This is by John Willis and actually extended with, by Jez Humble. Uh, John came up with CAMS, but Jez added the L. Uh, culture, which is the found rock, foundation of everything. And on top of that, we have automation, lean IT, measurements and sharing. So it's about um, automating stuff, measuring what's going on, sharing that information and allowing everybody to um, understand and make decisions. Uh, what is it? practically mean for you? Um, well, I split this up into various different things. So people, process, and products. I've taken that from Microsoft and then data because you're data people. So um, from a people perspective, you always need to be learning. 
um, and working within small autonomous skills with a broad skill set. So that's not necessarily one person has a broad skill set. If anything, DevOps is about the collaboration of specialists. So we're not necessarily saying everybody has to become a generalist. But what I am saying is that each team should own what they do. And within the team, you should have all the different people that are needed to make that happen. And that might involve some data specialists. It might also involve some generalists and it might also involve some developers or somebody else. And that team itself should be set up with the authority to run the thing and do the thing and deploy the thing on their own schedule and take joint ownership of both the success and the failure of that. Um, in many ways, Dev versus Ops has been pitched as devs have um, the responsibility for speed and ops have responsibility for safety and then they fight. And so by setting your teams up this way, it means everybody owns it jointly, which results in much, much better conversations and discussions when making various trade-offs. Uh, process. We need to focus on collaboration, feedback, make sure you understand what's going on in with your stuff in production. And on the one hand here, um, developers get frustrated that operations folks don't use source control, but at the same time, show me a developer that uses monitoring tools. It's about collaborating on all of this stuff as a single unit. And visualizing the value stream map and showing the constraints so that you can really easily see what needs to be improved. As for products, you need to be looking at Git, you need to be looking at CI and CD tools, whether that's as your DevOps, whether it's GitHub Actions, whether it's Jenkins, whether it's something else. Um, look at infrastructure as code, uh, whether that be ARM templates and PowerShell DSC, whether it's Puppet, whether it's Chef, whether it's Terraform, whether it's CloudFormation, wh whatever it is that you're using, um, make sure that you can, at the click of a button, spin up your infrastructure rather than managing it manually. Um, look at test frameworks and for SQL Server we're basically talking about T SQL T. Look at telemetry and monitoring tools. Um, and finally from a data perspective I gave you four metrics earlier. What are your numbers? How are you doing at them? What is your lead time for a standard change? What is your deployment frequency? What is your mean time to recovery? What is your change fail percentage? Do you know these things? Your data people you should. I'd like to finish with, I'd like to give the final word to Nicole Forsgren. She was the um, headline author of Accelerate. She wrote it with Jean Kim and Jess Humble. Um, and so she says the key to successful change is measuring and understanding the right things with a focus on capabilities, not maturity. We are done with maturity models. Um, what we want to focus on is what do you need to get done? How successful are you at it? And what do you need to do in order to achieve it? and go and do those things. Um, if you want to learn more about various topics that I've discussed in this presentation, um, if you want to learn more about environment creation and deployment, here are a whole bunch of great sessions. I've highlighted in orange the ones that are in the future, so you can watch them live. Uh, the white ones have already happened, so you're relying on going back and watching the videos afterwards. Um, if you're interested to see more specifically about the CI CD stuff, so what I showed you is an SSDT project, and I kind of clicked right click publish in Visual Studio, um, to deploy that locally for a dev database. Um, friends don't let friends right-click publish. In the real world, what we want to be doing is automating that as some sort of automated deployment pipeline. Um, so check out Chris Taylor's session where he's going to talk about that in a bit more detail. Uh, as for testing SQL Server, Hamish is speaking a bit later on about test-driven development with T-SQL T, and a couple of other people have done presentations already on it. Um, when we're talking about provisioning databases, we all also need to think about the data privacy aspects of that, and both Stu and Chris have got some sessions on that. Stu is speaking a bit later on. Um, as for rolling this out, Kendra Little has done a couple of great sessions. Um, and as for applying this to other slightly different things, if you're interested in uh, Databricks uh, or machine learning, um, then check out Jan and Richie's sessions. Um, and I'd also like to call out, just going back, oh yes, uh, if you're thinking... Uh, I did a kind of git clone f5 type job to create myself a dev environment. If you'd like to talk, think about bigger dev environments, shrinking them down so that you can use kind of production sized data sets on, on limited hardware, uh, check out the session I did with Sander yesterday um, called Solving the DevDB Problem with GitHub, Docker and DBA Clone. And that's all I have for you. I hope you've enjoyed the session. Um, I hope it's, uh, I recognize it's been a bit theory heavy, but it's a 101 session. Um, I hope it's been what you were looking for. Um, and leave me some great feedback. Thank you very much. All the best. Goodbye.